First Corinthians chapter, chapter one. I want to look at one verse, uh, two verses, verse 17, uh, 17 and 18. First Corinthians chapter one. Verse 17 and 18, if you have it, say amen. Uh, let us begin reading. It says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Verse 18 again says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Let's read it one more time. Can we read that all together? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And I just for a few moments want to talk from the subject, the foolishness of the gospel. The foolishness of the gospel. The foolishness of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, when you look at this place that we deem to be church, the local assembly, the gathering of the people of God, when you look at today's assembly, it seems to me that we have drifted far from the purpose of God. When you look at preachers today, as we mount the sacred desk to declare God's word, we have become tangled, tied up, messed up in preaching a financial prosperity gospel. When you take observation to the assignment that God has given us as preachers, we must understand that our assignment is a, a very sacred assignment because it's the assignment that's been given to us to get the word to the people of God that salvation through Christ is necessary if you're going to ever make it to this place called paradise. But yet we have fallen short as preachers along the way because when we preach this thing called the gospel, we have altered and tailored the message that we now try to gain the recognition of the people or find ourselves in some kind of popularity standard or even to gain the friendship of mankind simply because we want to fall amongst the ranks of some static quo of being recognized as profound preachers of a gospel that we entangle and tangle up certain words that become confusing to the ears of the listeners that they miss the whole point in truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, listeners that are under the unction of the sound of my voice find themselves trying to extract nuggets from the word that's going to empower them and give them some kind of fake hope 
that all I got to do is turn around and touch my toes three times and a miraculous blessing is going to hit my door. There's a whole lot of folk that's in the church today that are going to hell in a hand basket because we have missed the foundation of the preaching of the gospel. When you look at this thing called gospel, the word gospel within itself is a Greek word that means Yehu Edezo. This Greek word Yehu Edezo is a Greek word that is a compound Greek word. First part Greek word meaning to be uh, the good. The second part of this Greek word is a Greek word meaning muse. And when you put the two together, the Greek meaning of this word gospel is simply the good news. Look at somebody and tell them it's good news when you can hear about Christ dying and raised from the dead by the Father God that becomes my access key to eternal life. Uh, the gospel within itself is the good news. When you look at the scripture and the scriptures being outlined, uh, there's 66 books in the Bible. There's 39 Old Testament. There's 27 New Testament. But hidden in between the 39 and the 27, we have to extract the four books of the Bible that's called the Gospel according to Matthew. And then there is the Gospel according to Mark. Then there is the Gospel according to Luke. Then there is the Gospel according to John. When you look at these four, I don't think y'all ready for this this morning. Maybe I'm going too deep for y'all. Uh, when you look at the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will discover that the Gospels written by these four individuals all come from a different perspective or characteristics of their writings. When you look at Matthew, Matthew was considered a Hebrew tax collector. And because he was a Hebrew tax collector, his writing tailored the audience of the Hebrew. In other words, when you look at Matthew, Matthew writings are more talking to uh, the testimonies of Christ through uh, what Christ done in ministry. Uh, it shows us more of how Christ worked miracles and how Christ done certain things. He, he speaks more of parables to try to get his readers to understand through parables. When you look at Mark and you take observation of Mark's writings because Mark seemed to have walked with Peter and walked with Paul in ministry. Uh, when you look at Mark's writings, you'll discover that it's Mark who writes more uh, to uh, the, the Gentile or more to the Gentile nation. Those individuals that did not uh, inherit it. Uh, the gift of Christ, but to more of those individuals who simply because of his grace and mercy now have access to Christ. When you, you look at the writings of Mark, Mark tailors his right. In fact, it doesn't take Mark long to get to this point. When Mark writes, Mark writes quick and swift. He, he gets straight to the point and he deals with more of the miracles of Christ. In other words, he just doesn't write about the walk of Christ or the talk of Christ, but he walk, writes more of the walk of Christ. In other words, how many people know that Christ is an action God? And he just not doesn't only talk the talk, but he walks the talk that he talks. He, he shows up in action. If God said he was going to do it, then just hold on long enough and the actions will 
soon show up. The manifesto, manifestation of God. Well, if y'all ain't ready for this this morning, I, I think I'm wearing, I might be going a little too deep for some folks. Mark writes a different kind of gospel when it comes to Christ. When you look at Luke, Luke has been deemed the great physician. Some theologians declared that Luke was a physician. He was known for his skillful cutting with the scalpel as he is with his skillful writing with his penmanship. I'm getting happy already. When Luke writes his skillful penmanship, he, he writes it in such a way that he doesn't cut corners and no go around edges. But Luke comes straight to the point. In fact, when you look at Luke, Luke takes out a whole lot of these, does, thous, and this, but but he goes straight in to the point to try and help us get an understanding of what God came to do. If Luke said an apple was an apple, then an apple is an apple. If an orange is an orange, then an orange is an orange. He doesn't sugarcoat it in any kind of way. Look at your neighbor and tell them some folk in life need to get straight to the point. Don't need to sugarcoat stuff. Sometimes you can't sugarcoat everything with everybody. Some folk you just got to tell them just like it is. If somebody asks you how to dress look on them then don't sugarcoat it. Just tell them it's ugly. You need to take it off. If the soup, how my soup look today, if it's tight just tell them it's tight. You need to take it off. Some, some folk, you just got to get straight to the point. Luke writes to the Greek and he writes to these individuals and he gets straight to the point. John, when you look at John, John, John takes a whole different approach to the gospel of Christ. When John writes, he does not write concerning the historical fact of Christ. But yet what John does is takes the historical fact of Christ and he looks at it and then he writes through his interpretation. There's something about John and his writing. His writing is through his interpretation of Christ. But yet one thing I love about all these gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that the end of the day, they all come to the same conclusion. Then Christ died one Friday and rose early one Sunday morning with all power of it in his hands. They, they talk about the crucifixion of Christ. And might I suggest in this house today that we all can come to the same conclusion no matter how much weed you smoke, no matter how much drink you drink, no matter who you hopping with, chopping with, no matter what you're doing or how you're doing, we can all come to the conclusion that ain't none of us perfect in the house of, from the pool pit to the back door. We all got some shortcomings. So I ain't got time to judge you and you ain't got time to judge me. But we can all come to the same conclusion if it had not been for the shedding of the blood. Okay, somebody ought to got happy right there. Because there were some things that I've done Child of 
of God. Let me see if I can teach you a little bit. I'm trying to hurry up, but I'm trying not to get happy on me. Because when you look at this word provision, uh, this word provision is a compound word. In other words, this word pro means to know beforehand. When you look at the brief, the, the ending vision, now, it's where we get our English word video. I'm getting a little wise in my old age. In other words, uh, when I'm no longer reading the Bible just to read the Bible, but I realize that words have meanings. This word provision, pro meanings to see beforehand. The landing meaning vision, where we get our English word video. In other words, what God did was he already took a snapshot of your life before you showed up in life. That's a good thing to be happy that right day because Jeremiah 29 and 11 said it like this. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of good and not of evil to get you to an expected end. Well, I said, God, how can you possibly get me to an expected end? He said, go back to Jeremiah 1 and 5. Jeremiah 1 and 5 said, before I form you in your mother's womb, I already birthed forth for you to be ordained a prophet. In other words, he already knew. In other words, God has a video of your life. That, that everything that you come up against, everything that the enemy tries to do against you, God has already made provision for you to survive. That's about right there because when the enemy tried to take you out when he tried to take your mind when he tried to take your life I didn't have to turn to the bottle I didn't have to turn to the blunt I didn't have to turn to the book but yet I got in the book because there's something about being in the book that God speaks to me uh, we took a journey went down to Atlanta I told you the story but on the way out of the city come across 275 because 75 is shut down between Springwell and all the way down through the bridge to the Springwell exit further down. You can't go that way. But yet there was already a foreseen detour that had to take us out of town through 275. Uh, I come around 275 uh, behind an automobile who ought not have even been on the street if I had time. I asked him, where did you get your license? You're holding up traffic. But because I was impatient, something about being impatient can get you in trouble. Because I was impatient, I spun around the automobile. And because I didn't know what was on the other side, I hit an enormous pothole. I hit the pothole, continued to drive. Because the car did not change, but the damage was already done. I get down to about Dayton, and because I was cruising about 85 miles an hour coming up on uh, Dayton, Ohio, and my car, an uh, indicator light came on, and the indicator light says, you need to check your monitor tire system. Uh, I hit the message bar and begin to check the air pressure in my tires. Front left tire was holding at 32 pressure. Uh, front right tire was holding at about 33 pressure. Uh, back left tire was holding at about 32 pressure. Uh, right back tire was holding at about 34 or so in the pressure, which means that I ain't losing no air pressure. Didn't know what's going on. But indicator light come on again. And the kid like say you need to check your tire monitor system. I hit the message bar again, front left tire holding it about 32 pounds of pressure. Uh, front right tire holding at about 33 or so pounds per pressure. Uh, back left tire holding at 32 pounds pressure. Right side tire somewhere around 33, 34. Uh, I say I'm not losing no air it must be a malfunction in the communication with the system. Uh, something say you better pull over to the rest store area and check out the vehicle. Got out, looked at the front, right, front, left tire, and there was a knot on the side of 
the title about big is my face. I say, well, I cannot continue my journey because there is a cosmetic defect. Somebody catch it at the wild. That could hinder the performance of my vehicle. Found in Dayton, Ohio. We found a Walmart. Went in the Walmart, priced the new tire, came out of the Walmart, and as the guy was riding up the vehicle to put the new tire on the front, I glanced at the rear driver's side, and I realized that the rear tire had a knot on the side of the tire. Just as big as the one in the front. I said, well, young folk and I look at these young kids and, and I look on Gwen how fast they can text. It take me 30 seconds to send my baby a message. How are you? 30 minutes to type how are you? How are you seven letters, three words, thirty minutes, and before I can hit the send button, I get a reply. Good, what you want? <laughs> I said, well, I didn't want nothing. I'm just checking on you. Is everything all right? Before I can hit the send button, I'm trying to hire you. I don't know how these young folk can text. I watch yes. how quick they can text. But I don't care how fast they can text. God was the original text message. Yeah. Well, that's what you're saying. Uh, anything you want to know, God did already text. Wife called me one time. Wife said, Baby, on your way home. I need you to go by Walgreens. My prescription is ready. Would you pick up my prescription for me? I said, okay, I'll, I'll pick it up. It was about 12 o'clock. Uh, she said, I'll send you a text message to remind you to pick up the medicine. I said, all right, no problem, baby. Uh, got off work about 3 o'clock, about 3.10, I was headed home, forgot about the medicine, but all About 3.10, the phone goes off. I, I open it up. It said, text from 
your number one baby. Open up the text message. Look at the text message. It say, don't forget to go by Walgreens and pick up my medicine. In other words, God is the same with us. When your enemies are coming up against you, God already sent you a text. Psalms 20 says, Psalms 27 says, the Lord is my life and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom should I be afraid? When the enemies and my foes come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumble and they fail. Look at somebody and say, God was an original text messenger. When you in need and don't know how, you gonna make I'm getting happy. I still not want. He maketh me to lie down and breathe. Look at somebody say, the Lord is an original text messenger. When folk are trying to condemn you and talk about you and scandalize you just because you're trying to do right, he already sent you a text message. He sent that text message in Rome. But walk after the spirit. Look at somebody say, He's already sent you a text message when you're going through struggles in life and you can't find your way out. You don't know which way to turn, and it seems like joy has ran out of your life. He sent you a text already. He put it in James chapter chapter 1, verse 2, where he says, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Look at your neighbor and say, He already sent you a text. He already sent you a text. He sent you a text already. When you're troubled in your heart and don't know why you're troubled, he sent you a text. He, he put that text over in John 14 verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. I feel like I'm getting happy up in here. God is the original sin. There's something about God's text message that if I lay hold message of God. He got a way of reminding me that everything gonna be alright. Let me see if I can walk through the text just a little bit here. When you look at Paul, Paul is writing to a body at the church of Corinth. These individuals at in Corinth, uh, Corinth being a cesspool place. Everything you want, you can find at Corinth. Everything you thought was pleasing to your flesh, Corinth in the city Corinth. The problem with the city of Corinth is what was on the outside showed up on the inside of the sanctuary, which means that the sanctity of the sanctuary started looking like the world uh, out on the outside started looking like the church. Uh, they started talking to Paul. Paul writes to Corinth and he helps the church of Corinth to know and to understand uh, that you got to realize that there's something about the good news of Christ. That no matter what you're going through and no matter how you feel, there, there's something about the good news of Christ. He, he says, watch verse 17. He says, when I preach this particular gospel, I don't have to use big words. Uh, he says, I ain't got to try to flaunt a show. Although I sat at the feet of Camillion, although of the gospel, the man who was all wise through the gospel, although I sat in his seat, it don't take all of that. He says, I didn't come just to baptize, although baptism is good, but if I don't get to dump none of you, I'd rather be able to extend the gospel to you. If I don't get to submerge anyone in the water, it's still something about the preaching of the gospel. He says, Oh. 
Look at somebody say the Greek word for foolishness in the text is boreal. Somebody say Morion. Y'all ain't talking to me in here. I guess I have to preach this all by myself. Uh, Dale, the Greek word for foolishness in the text is Morion. Uh, Morion is where we got our old English word from called moronic or moronic. Uh, this word moronic is means to be foolish. Uh, it means to be ignorant. It means to act in ignorant action. It's called more on, uh, where translated into New English when New English language showed up and we went from Old English to New English, the word moronic got translated into moron. Moron means to be stupid. Well, I had to have a talk with Paul. Well, Paul, you can't tell the people uh, that they stupid. He says, look here, let me tell you something, preacher. He says, listen, uh, there's some folk that believe the gospel is foolishness. Uh, they are like morons. Uh, they are stupid. He says, but look here, uh, let them uh, call me a moron because I think it's moronic or a moron for someone not to believe in the preaching of the gospel. Uh, whether you believe or not believe, I believe uh, that if you confess your mouth, believe in your heart, Lord God died, God raised it from the dead, the Bible says you say it is something about the foolishness of preaching the gospel uh, that gives me my inheritance to eternal life. If it had not been for someone's foolishness uh, of preaching the gospel uh, to help me to understand that there was a better way, God had a better plan, God had a better purpose, that a fulfillment of my life was going to come if I just look at things better and understand that I can be better and things will be better if I trust in the betterness or the betterness of my Christ, uh, then things will get better for me. Then call me moronic or moron if you want to. But last time I checked when I was sick in my body, wasn't nobody there but me and the Lord. Last time I checked when I didn't have no money in my pocket, it wasn't nobody there but me and the Lord. Last time I checked when I was at the edge of losing my mind, about to go crazy, things was bombarding me, it wasn't nobody there but me and the Lord. They call me a moron all you want, but yet if it had not been for the shedding of his blood, the Bible declares that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Look at somebody, nudge them real good, tell them wake up along here. Your last thought should have killed you, but because of God's grace and mercy, you are still alive. said, look here, let me help you out. Uh, to them that don't believe, to them that are perishing, to them that have no hope, to them that have no glory of God, to them that don't have no understanding. Now you gotta watch this. God says my people perish for the lack of knowledge. But you got to understand this knowledge because knowledge only comes through studying the word of God. And when you study the word of God then you must understand and study the word of God. I grow and birth and understanding of God. You can never get to where God wants you to go if you have not understood the word of God. The problem with many of us is that our ideologists or our idiots or idioticness of thinking, look it up when you get home, it's a word, our idioticness of thinking actually insults the intelligence of God because we try to rationalize God through what we been through and the things that we have done. But you can't rationalize God out of what you've been through because most of the time we hang our hats on God through our own understanding. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge Him and He will and she'll direct your Look at your neighbor saying your name. Stop trying to rationalize God through your understanding. Paul says it's foolishness to some about this gospel. He says, How can one man go to Calvary and die on this cross? He says, To others, it becomes foolishness. But to us who believe in 
the word. It is the power of God. I, I'm happy now. <laughs> because when I look back over my life, Deacon Joe and I think about where I used to be. I, I, I get happy all over again. Yes. Because when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he done for me, my, 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 my soul says, hallelujah. Yes. When I think about when I was down and out, when I didn't have enough change in my pocket to make a clean, clean, nor did I have enough dollars to make a fold in my pocket. That if we take observation, we can give understanding as we look at the illustration that God left for us to follow the blueprint. And if we follow the blueprint, we can come and understand that the Lord will, He will make everything all right. around when 